and welcome to Trend Lines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Elliot Waldman. Just a quick note before we get started that if you like what you hear on Trend Lines, you can stay up to date with new episodes by hitting the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. You can also find a full archive of previous episodes at worldpoliticsreview.com slash podcast. If his pre-recorded speech to the United Nations General Assembly last month was any indication, Vladimir Putin stands ready to cooperate with the international community on solving the world's most pressing challenges. He will assist other countries with their fight against COVID-19, negotiate a new arms control agreement with the United States, and sign a binding treaty prohibiting the use of weapons in outer space. Missing from the speech, of course, were Russia's ongoing involvement in a slew of conflicts overseas, from eastern Ukraine to Syria to Libya, which have often made those issues even more intractable. And despite Putin's efforts to project the image of a productive and internationally engaged great power, recent developments in neighboring countries suggest, if anything, a decline in Russian influence. In Belarus, President Alexander Lukashenko is clinging to power despite the regular chants from thousands of protesters demanding he resign. Serious fighting has flared up again between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, and Kyrgyzstan is in chaos after protests forced the country's Russia-friendly president to resign. How Putin responds to these crises could be a deciding factor in whether Russia can continue to play an active role in the countries of its so-called near-abroad, or whether these countries come to see other major players like Turkey and China as their more important partners. I'm very happy to be joined now to discuss this by Matthew Rojanski. He's director of the Kennan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars in Washington, D.C. Matt, thanks for joining us and uh, welcome to Trendlines. Thanks, Elliot. Happy to be with you. So I thought I would start by asking you to just set the scenes a little bit for us and explain the role that countries on Russia's periphery play in Putin's uh, strategic mindset. I know obviously each one has a very different value, but uh, what is Putin thinking as he sees the situation deteriorate in so many of uh, the countries near Russia? So this is an important framing question for understanding Russia and also U.S.-Russia relations. And uh, I think a very good jumping off point Elliot, is a word that you used perhaps unintentionally, but I think very importantly in your introduction when you uh, spoke about the challenges on Russia's periphery, you used the term overseas. And in fact, for Americans, it's almost always the case that when we have foreign policy challenges, uh, no matter how close they are to vital American national interests, that they are by definition overseas. Um, And this isn't just a geographic point, it's uh, psychological, it's political. Uh, For the United States, most foreign policy challenges are remote from basic questions of the survival uh, of the United States. There are, of course, exceptions to that, like, for example, nuclear proliferation or the risk of a conflict with another major power, a nuclear power like Russia or China. But by and large, even really serious foreign policy crises Um, For example, the the hunt for bin Laden a decade ago, uh, the fight against ISIS, etc., don't implicate the survival of uh, the American people or the American government or the American way of life. Russians tend to look very differently at those challenges, and in part it is geography, the fact that the, the many crises throughout Eurasia, whether they're part of the greater Middle East, which, you know, arguably the South Caucasus, Nagorno Karabakh is, uh, whether it's uh, about Europe and the kind of geopolitical push-pull of East versus West in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, a la Belarus, Ukraine, uh, whether it's about uh, Asia, China's rising power, um, or the generally, I think, um, underappreciated and, and under um, attended space of Central Asia, of which Kyrgyzstan is a, is a part, a very dynamic, uh, if small part, um, you know, Afghanistan, et cetera, all of these things are within arguably uh, the immediate uh, sort of neighboring zone around Russia. It's it's a zone that uh, past Russian leaders, including Dmitry Medvedev, and I think Putin himself uh, have talked about as a, as a sphere of privileged uh, interests or influence, um, uh, what commonly international relations co- uh, scholars will call a sphere of in- influence, 
Uh, you know, Americans and Western Europeans often reject that characterization of the former Soviet space. But but here's where I come down. Uh, Russia has, for two decades, quite actively under Vladimir Putin, asserted its uh, privileges, its uh, veto rights, if you will, over outcomes that it doesn't like in this part of the world, in in the the former Soviet republics, especially that are on its borders. Uh, and in a way, it has made its own bed and now must lie in it precisely because evolution toward liberal democratic or fairly stable democratic uh, political regimes in these countries has been unacceptable for Russia, described often as color revolutions that are threatening to the survival of the Russian state. Um, the Russians have helped to prevent those outcomes. They haven't been solely responsible for it, but they've done very little to construct stable alternatives. And that's why you end up with the long-term uh, continuation of a Lukashenko regime in Belarus, um, you know, until very recently, a fairly authoritarian-leaning uh, regime in, in Armenia, um, a very long-term authoritarian regime in uh, Azerbaijan, uh, you know, repeated in political instability and revolutions against uh, regimes in Kyrgyzstan uh, and others in the former Soviet region. And, and the only stability to be found, it turns out, is in Russia itself. And that is, of course, the stability of one man rule by Vladimir Putin. And, and maybe the second example of that would be Kazakhstan with the, with the relative stability of one man rule by Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. But that's even being challenged now as Nazarbayev has attempted a peaceful hand picked transition, having stepped back from power, but almost everywhere else throughout the region, and, and again, arguably in part, thanks to Russia's own doing, uh, Russia is sur surrounded by an innate instability uh, of the regimes. How much self-awareness do you suppose there is on the part of Putin and other Russian leaders of this dynamic that you described, that their uh, attempts to stack the deck in the favor of more authoritarian leaders would eventually come to a head and lead to instability as people uh, demand more political rights and uh, more civil participation in their governments. How surprised do you suppose uh, Russian leaders were by these developments that we're seeing now? That's a, that's a fascinating question, Elliot. I don't know for sure what, what Vladimir Putin uh, or any other Russians may be thinking, of course, I can only speculate. Um, but I have to believe that in two respects, the official Kremlin outlook on the events in the post-Soviet space now and, and in the recent past um, is very different than what most Americans or other Westerners might presume. Um, one respect is, is the belief that there's not an alternative. I think that we in the West presume that some form of stable free market liberal democracy with protection of basic rights and pluralism is the de facto alternative, is the default path, um, the end of history, uh, as Francis Fukuyama famously termed it at the end of the Cold War, the path towards which, you know, all developed countries will eventually head. Some assume China would go that way too. Um, and and setting aside the, the big and I think real debate about that in uh, Western intellectual and policy circles, I think that's very far from a consensus in Moscow. And I think most uh, senior Russians would tell you that that's an illusion, um, that the the only kind of stability that's possible is one that's grounded in kind of long-standing national interests um, uh, that's very uh, nationalist in nature that, uh, if not ethno-nationalist, is, le is at least, um, you know, anchored to a very robust uh, defense of national interests uh, and that the more power that a country has uh, to defend its interests, the more it will extend those interests beyond its borders necessarily. Um, I think that's one big difference between the way that Americans uh, at least describe the world and the way that Russians do. And then I think the second big difference relevant to your, your question about whether this is these are surprising developments is that in a sense, um, senior Russians, whether they're surprised or not, 
if you look at Foreign Minister Lavrov, if you look at Vladimir Putin uh, and his closest foreign policy and national security advisors, they seldom appear to be uh, taken by surprise by developments in the post-Soviet space because they always seem ready, in a sense, to engage with any new leadership uh, in, in former Soviet republics as long as that leadership um, doesn't cross the red line, which is to aspire to join the American camp or the NATO, EU, kind of pro-Western and, in their view, anti-Russian camp. That's why when Armenia had its revolution two years ago uh, and the, the very reformist, you know, very new thinking Nicole Pashinyan uh, came in uh, to replace the outgoing president, uh, Sarkisyan, uh, prime minister, rather, um, it wasn't a problem for Moscow. I mean, this is a totally new figure. This was not a guy, as far as anyone could tell, who'd been cultivated by the Kremlin. And yet, because he stopped short of rejecting close ties with Russia, Armenia is, in fact, a treaty ally of Russia, um, the Russians seemed fine with that change and, and figured we'll, we'll find a way to work with them. Um, and then similarly, in Kyrgyzstan, this has happened now multiple times, where as long as Kyrgyzstan doesn't go too far, uh, to depart from a kind of Russia-oriented sphere, uh, the Russians seem perfectly comfortable. Let let the Kyrgyz sort things out domestically. Uh, you could argue this is kind of a political mercantilism in the post-Soviet space. That you know, as long as as long as the profits are still there to accrue to savvy Russian uh, foreign and security policymakers, they don't really much care about the process for getting there. Uh, and and then it, back to my first point they have no abiding faith that there is a morally correct or a historically determined process that runs through democracy. Does the distinction you just laid out explain why Russia took a very different approach to the events in Ukraine in 2014, where uh, former President Viktor Yanukovych was ousted uh, from the presidency and the country started to visibly shift in a more uh, European and Western friendly direction? Yes, yes, it absolutely does, Elliot. Um, in, in in one respect, which is very much in, in the mind's eye of, of Russians, and that is the perception that Ukraine was necessarily, that, that Ukraine's, um, at that time, you know, ambition to grow, to grow closer to the West, its budding uh, association with the European Union would necessarily take an anti-Russian turn. I think it's a counterfactual. It's almost impossible to prove, but I would suggest that it certainly wouldn't have taken nearly as much of an anti-Russian turn had Russia not intervened, had Russia not seized Crimea by force and then uh, essentially invaded eastern Ukraine. But again, it's, it's, it's a counterfactual because that did happen. But then there are two unique wrinkles of the Ukrainian situation um, that I think Russians understood, again, differently uh, than we in the West have done. Uh, because of their their historical experience, one is just how close Russia and Ukraine really were in so many ways, um, historically, culturally, uh, linguistically, and none of this is to is to um, ignore uh, or denigrate the the very real independent history of Ukrainian culture, uh, language, Ukrainian peoplehood. That's all very real. But Russians feel themselves acutely close to Ukraine. Uh, family ties, uh, Russian literature, so much of, of which has actually come out of, uh, has been written in Ukraine and about Ukraine, uh, even if described as Russia, because it was at that time part of the Russian Empire. Uh, you know, every second Russian will tell you about summers in Ukraine at Babushka's house uh, and so on. So this, this intense sense of closeness, um, that's one wrinkle that Americans will just never understand. Um, it's just, we, we don't, even with Canada, we don't have a feeling of the kind that Russians and Ukrainians uh, have towards one another, um, uh, which is not always positive, but is very, very close. Uh, and, then, and then second is a, a unique wrinkle of Ukraine's history, which is that it's an enormous country. It's actually the largest country in Europe besides Russia by territory. And um, part of that means that it encompasses a truly uh, vast and diverse range of uh, historical experiences, a big part of which is the historical experience of Western Ukraine, which was never connected to Russia really in any way until after World War II, when, when in the wake of 
or the defeated uh, Nazi German occupiers, uh, the Soviet Union came in and the Red Army occupied Western Ukraine. And, and this is a part of Ukraine that therefore all through Soviet times and even in post-Soviet times um, has been pretty virulently anti-Russian, uh, really, really bristled at being forced to speak Russian uh, and to be dominated by uh, Soviet elites in Kiev, who were always much more Russified, uh, and then, of course, by Moscow itself for the 40, uh, 45 years of uh, Soviet power. Um, and then in the post-Soviet era, always led, all through the 1990s and 2000s, always led in the most um, kind of Ukrainianized version of national identity and and politics of modern Ukraine as compared to, for example, Eastern Ukraine, now the famously, you know, occupied and war-torn Donbass region, which was much more overwhelmingly Russian-speaking, culturally Russian-oriented, historically Russian-oriented, and in fact, for hundreds of years, had been in the Russian Empire, where where this far western part of Ukraine never had. I'm no expert by any means on uh, Eastern Europe, but it strikes me that the the closeness you're describing between Russia and Eastern Ukraine is also present in a certain way in Belarus. Uh, and yet there's been a much more cautious approach from Russia to to the events there. Obviously, uh, uh, Lukashenko is clinging to power and, and so far has not really given an indication that he'd be willing to relinquish it. But I wonder if you see uh, Russia as having learned a little bit from its involvement in Ukraine in terms of the approach it's taking in Belarus right now, given the protests there. It's a fair question. Uh, the, the problem with answering whether Russia has learned is we just still don't know. Um, if in some months uh, or even years, Mr. Putin decides to intervene in Belarus in, in the same way he's intervened in, in Ukraine, um, I think the outcomes will be similarly disastrous. Uh, I, I think it's hard to argue that anybody won in Ukraine. Uh, the country has been severely damaged, but so has Russia's interests in the country uh, been severely damaged. And so has a relationship that was purportedly so important to Russia been damaged. So I think the same would happen in Belarus where Russia to intervene. And the fact that it hasn't done so yet may indicate a lesson having been learned. But it may equally well indicate the dynamic I talked about earlier, which is um, a kind of mercantilist political attitude, which is, hey, it's, it's all about the benefits that we can extract or the bad outcomes that we can prevent. We don't really much care how people in neighboring countries live uh, as long as we're okay with the outcomes. And I don't think, while, while the hearts of many Russians, uh, and Lord knows my own, um, as an American who feels very close to this region, go out to the Belarusian people for what they're suffering now. Um, I don't think the Russian leadership cares if it takes uh, 5,000 people beaten and arrested, if it takes 50,000 people beaten and arrested uh, to ensure that the outcome in Belarus is not anti-Russian. I think the Russians are fine with that. If, on the other hand, uh, it goes in the direction of Armenia two years ago, uh, or, or, or Kyrgyzstan several years ago, or what might be Kyrgyzstan this year, uh, which is, you know, maybe, well, the violence has already happened, but let's say not much further violence, and Lukashenko goes, and, uh, you know, new people rise to power in Belarus, as long as they stop short of pursuing uh, a strongly pro-Western and, and anti-Russian agenda, you know, the Russians will find their will find their peace with them and will also find their ways to exert control and leverage. Um, so I think it's been wise on the part of the Belarusian opposition thus far uh, to to steer as clear as they can from geopolitics. There's some implicit geopolitics, of course, when uh, Tikhanovskaya, the opposition leader, you know, goes to an EU and NATO country, Lithuania, as her as her base, um, as her exile. Uh, and then, of course, does a sort of uh, goodwill tour of Western governments and gets a lot of support. There's some implicit geopolitics in that. But, you know, the West is awfully distracted by its own problems now. There doesn't seem to be nearly the, the kind of push that there was uh, with Ukraine, uh, thanks in part to a very robust Ukrainian diaspora in Western Europe and the United States and Canada, Britain, uh, etc. There's nowhere near the same push uh, to get involved in Belarus. Uh, and so I think the Russians are probably... Uh, less panicked than they would have otherwise been. But, you know, 
just because they haven't intervened so far doesn't mean that they won't. In some of the other crises that I mentioned, we see the influence of non-Western powers coming in. Uh, For example, in Nagorno-Karabakh, Turkey very prominently backing uh, Azerbaijan's military offensive. Uh, The Russian-Turkish relationship strikes me as 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 such an interesting one, and one where despite uh, being on the opposite sides of so many conflicts around the world, you still see some efforts to uh, have some warm vibes, some cooperation, some alignment on certain issues. How do you suppose Russia would view a situation where Turkey starts to play more of an influence in uh, the South Caucasus? Would that be a, a deal breaker? Or would it be a bit more acceptable for, for Putin? Well, I think we've already seen that situation. Uh, Turkey is playing an enormous role right now uh, via Azerbaijan, I would argue almost as a proxy. It's it's hard to define that term exactly, and it's that would be hard to prove precisely. But it, it looks as if um, Turkey is pulling significant strings and, and at least Turkey views Azerbaijan as its proxy. If you look at the, um, the advertising and the political slogans that have been reported out of uh, Istanbul and Ankara, uh, it, it certainly sounds like this is Turkey's proxy war. The question is against whom? Uh, I would say it's not Turkey's proxy war against Russia. Turkey doesn't seek a proxy war against Russia. That would be disastrous. Uh, this is a proxy war against Armenia. And so the real question for the Turks is how much more can they beat up on Armenia, which is Russia's treaty ally, uh, even as Russia has always tried to maintain a kind of balance between Armenia and Azerbaijan. How much more can, can the Turks beat up on Armenia uh, before Russia feels compelled to act? And um, so far, they're within the zone of, of possibility. Uh, what, what leverage exactly Ankara has uh, that, that it may think it can continue down this path, I, I'm not sure, because um, I think the evidence the last time the Turks crossed the line uh, and got into a direct confrontation with the Russians, of course, setting aside hundreds of years of Russo-Turkish wars, but in recent memory, it was 2015 when the Turks semi-accidentally shot down a Russian fighter that had strayed over Turkish airspace uh, in in Syria uh, or on the border with Syria, uh, that proved very quickly to be a real crisis in Russo-Turkish relations, but that both sides patched up equally quickly because clearly there was there was zero desire on either side uh, to see things, you know, take a military turn, for example. Um, so you had sanctions and 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 um, counter sanctions, and you had some harsh diplomatic statements. But then, pretty quickly, the two sides patched it up. So, speaking really just about the geopolitics, it's no comment on the state of the war on the ground, which is you know just catastrophic, with hundreds of casualties at least on both sides, and and civilians suffering tremendously. Um, it it looks like as long as Turkey feels safe continuing to, to um, back Azerbaijan in prosecuting this war, uh, that there's no, there's no incentive for them to stop. Um, on the other hand, again, the fact that Russia hasn't intervened yet doesn't mean that it won't. You could certainly imagine a situation where an errant or intentional attack on Armenian territory proper, so not, not the Karabakh, um, uh, unrecognized Karabakh Republic, or the um, Azerbaijani lands that are held by Armenia as a buffer around Karabakh, but but Armenia itself, internationally recognized uh, Armenia, if it were to suffer a major attack, I think that the political pressure, um, if for no other reason, from from the very considerable Armenian uh, diaspora in Russia, uh, would be irresistible, and Moscow would, at a minimum, uh, put pressure on Ankara to stop its support for Azerbaijan. Uh, But I could even imagine the Russians doing something more demonstrative, like sending sending some kind of, um, you know, aircraft with troops or supplies or something to Armenia, so as to signal basically, okay, it ends now, uh, unless you want unless you want the Russians coming in. And I don't think I don't think any of the belligerents other than Armenia would like to see that. How much of a constraint do Russia's uh, finances and its uh, military adventures in other countries pose here, given how uh, thinly stretched it is? It's a good question. I, I'm not the kind of expert on Russia's military capabilities to give you a very authoritative answer, Elliot. I, I would say that 
Um, it, it is probably the case that Russia has enough capabilities to handle uh, the crises that need mil- that need application of military capability. Uh, right now, Russia has an enormous military um, that is increasingly well trained and well equipped and increasingly capable. And in some ways, um, there's a I don't know quite the right metaphor, but the more you use the muscle of the professional military uh, in an expeditionary capacity, as Russia has done now quite a lot. For initially, Georgia and eastern Ukraine and now Syria, Libya and other places, perhaps, the more capable it is, the more um, the stronger that muscle is. And, and I think that far from being you know, drained down to the dregs, I think the Russian military would be fully capable uh, to execute the kind of relatively defined narrow missions that it would need to do for signaling purposes, where I think Russia is, um, uh, you know, much more um, drained or stretched thin is financially and politically. Um, Financially, the Russian economy has been hammered by COVID and by low energy prices, just like many others. Um, the, uh, The Russian military has actually suffered budget cuts for the first time in a decade because of this. Uh, and politically, you know, the Russians are still suffering the isolation uh, led by the United States, but backed up by many important Russian partners, uh, including most of Europe, in the wake of the 2004 Ukraine operation. And so, um, you know, to, to worsen that situation needlessly would not be very attractive to Russia. Um, moreover, it, it does take a lot of bandwidth, given how you know, narrow and pyramidal Russia's uh, decision-making apparatus is, the fact that everything has to end up at a relatively high level to be decided um, means that, you know, a lot of that high-level bandwidth is exhausted right now. There are only so many crises just almost psychologically that one can manage it at once, even if one, you know, is Vladimir Putin and, and is clearly highly capable. Um, this is This is six-dimensional chess at this point. And um, I think the inclination may be, I'm I'm not in their heads, but uh, if I were uh, in the Kremlin right now, the inclination may be to let the crises that can be allowed to continue to simmer do so and deal only with the kind of immediate and urgent and see how things develop, Um, especially with a U.S. election pending, um, with so much uncertainty in Europe you know, this is this is a fairly good time to, to play wait and see and try to make the best of whatever the outcomes are. Maybe after listening to this podcast, the Kremlin will give you a call for advice. Let's say I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you before we wrap up also about uh, the situation in Kyrgyzstan, because this, this seems to be a, a region, a country and a region where Russia has been in... Uh, a contest for influence, but also a sort of cooperative relationship as well with uh, with China. What kind of a challenge does that dynamic pose to, to Russia as it tries to uh, potentially salvage the situation there? So number one, uh, the situation in Kyrgyzstan is, is not Russia's to salvage. Um, it, if it had been, I think Russia would have acted much more decisively in 2005 or in 2010, um, the last two significant uh, Kyrgyz political crises. Russia instead has sat back and and let the Kyrgyz kind of muddle through things as long again as long as that red line of Kyrgyzstan uh, rushing into the American embrace uh, has not been crossed and it hasn't been crossed and I think it's unlikely to be crossed. Um, there are enough forces uh, on all sides of the multi-dimensional Kyrgyz uh, political fight that that Russia can work with that I think it it needn't take um, significant action now. But the the longer term dynamic of Central Asia's economic orientation, one could even say back towards China, um, though it's been a long interlude, obviously, of of Central Asian um, orientation towards Moscow under the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. uh, That, I think, is a significant concern, but it's very important not to overstate it. Uh, there There are those who for, you know, a decade or more have been arguing, you know, China's the new imperial power uh, in, in Middle Asia, uh, as, as the Russians formerly, uh, called it. Um, I, I don't think that's the case now. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be the case anytime soon. Um, for two reasons. Number one, because, uh, Chinese have, have said that 
uh, and I think they've said that with with good evidence behind them. I mean, I've asked them personally um, in the region and and in China, um, both you know regions bordering Russia and in Beijing. Um, they're, they're simply the, the Chinese are not looking to challenge Russia's very long standing um, prerogatives, if you will, in Central Asia right now. Um, that's one reason, and the second reason. Um, is the Chinese really have their hands full. Uh, their orientation for strategic competition, or, or what we in, in Washington have um, taken to calling great power competition, is very clearly um, looking eastward at this point, looking out over the Pacific uh, at the United States and uh, more closer, closer in, of course, at American allies uh, and what they would consider proxies like Taiwan and South Korea and Japan uh, in China's immediate maritime neighborhood. Um, and and to have a secure flank, uh, as both Russia and China, in effect, do by virtue of their strategic alignment. I don't want to call it an alliance, but it's it's something short of that. Um, that's an invaluable commodity. That's really uh, priceless. And Vladimir Putin himself has said that. I remember he was famously asked at the end of his first two terms as president what his biggest foreign policy accomplishment was, and he says it was the border agreement with China. Um, I think that's very telling. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Elliot. Thank you. Matt Rojansky is director of the Kennan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. If you'd like to comment on the discussion, ask a question, or even suggest a topic for a future episode, drop us a line at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. This episode of Trendlines was produced by me, Elliot Waldman, and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow both of us on Twitter. My handle is at Elliot Waldman. That's two L's, one T. Peter is at P-E-T-E-R-D-O-E-R-R-I-E. Thanks for listening and tune in again next week. Mm-hmm.